December 1991. Near Montreal, Quebec, provincial police investigate a string of unusual break and enters. We break into empty houses, find their lingerie, lay it out on the bed, then he would stab him. It was almost like he was practicing to what he wanted to do to a real body. The ritual soon takes a more sinister turn as clothing is replaced with living victims. Here's a butcher who actually, rather than butchering animals, was butchering women. Along with police, there are those who chronicle the investigation up close, on film, on paper, and on tape. They are the public's first witness. Through their lens, they capture our darkest chapters of crime. When serial killers strike, they often leave unique telltale marks on the bodies of their victims. But if they hide evidence and change locations, the full extent of their crimes can go unnoticed for years. In Quebec, a man now known as the Butcher of St. Eustache covered his tracks and rehearsed his sadistic fantasies before a final wave of bloodshed exposed him for the killer he really was. Adjacent to Montreal, Canada's second largest metropolis, sits the small and predominantly French-speaking city of Verdun. Verdun is a very blue-collar working class area of Montreal. It's on the southwest end of the island. In 1989, one of Verdun's residents is 30-year-old Anna Maria Cordina Leva a single mother and an employee at a nearby food processing plant. At the time, she is in the early stages of a relationship involving a co-worker named Serge Archambault. Who they've been working together at this uh, food processing plant in the East End of Montreal, struck up a friendship. He, and even though her co-worker was married and she knew that, he was married and a father. Um, they started an affair. Anna Maria is excited about the new romance. She confides in her mother, explaining that Serge has promised to eventually leave his wife and marry her. June 16th, 1989, a pleasant spring evening, a Friday. Anna Maria dresses up and does her hair for a date with Serge. Before heading off, she leaves her three young children in the care of her brother. She meets up with Serge as planned, but at some point, the evening takes a tragic turn. June 17th, the following morning, Anna Maria doesn't return to pick up her children. With no reason to suspect foul play, her brother assumes she is simply spending extra time with her new boyfriend. But as the day passes, concern grows. Anna Marie's parents soon learn of their daughter's absence. They eventually phone the police. More than two days since she was last seen by her family, a missing persons report is filed for Anna Maria Cordina Leva. Her parents told the police that the night she disappeared, she had told them that she had a date with one of her co-workers, Serge Archambault. That, that was her only clue. Police visit the food processing plant where Anna Maria works. It's one of the first things you do is you talk to the colleagues and co-workers and, you know, when did you last see her and so on and so forth. But it never went past that because they, they never got any more information. When police speak directly with Serge, he admits to having a relationship with the missing woman, but denies any knowledge of her disappearance. They asked me a few questions, he answered, and, and that was it. But yeah, maybe we went on a date, but when I left her, she was alive. She was fine, and you know, I don't know what happened to her. It satisfied the police uh, that, okay, he doesn't know either, that 
either he had dropped her off and, you know, when he last saw her, she was fine. 30-year-old Anna Maria Cordina Leva seems to have vanished into thin air, leaving three young children in the care of her family. They investigated as much as they could and had absolutely no leads to go on. They had no idea whether she had run off, if somebody had kidnapped her and run off with her, whether she'd been killed. At that point, it wasn't even murder investigation because they had no body. It's just, here's a missing person who hasn't shown up and left no trace. So they, the investigation kind of went nowhere. As the weeks turn into months, hopes of finding the missing woman fade. If she is the victim of foul play, police will need a fresh lead to solve the case. That lead will eventually materialize, but not before a string of horrific crimes shock the province. Fall, 1991. More than two years have passed since Anna Maria was last seen alive. A number of mysterious break and enters rattle residents in the Laurentian Mountains, just a short drive from the city where Anna Maria went missing. Homeowners return to disturbing scenes. A suspect has ransacked their bedrooms and laid out women's clothing in the shape of a human body. Crude mannequins that the suspect has attacked with a knife. There was, I think, at least a dozen break-ins where Women came home and found on their beds their underwear, lingerie, cut pieces, all shredded, sliced, and then often with the knife still stuck there. But it was almost like he was, he was like practicing or whatever to what he wanted to do to a real body. I'm going to fight my urges, not do this to real women, but I'll pretend. The intrusions are investigated by provincial police. At one location, officers discover traces of the suspect's semen, strengthening suspicions of a sadistic sexual motive behind the break-ins. Although not widely reported in the press, rumors of the break-ins spread by word of mouth in the Laurentian Mountain area. New locks are installed on many homeowners' doors and fears on the rise particularly amongst women living alone. That fear is soon justified, as mannequins made of clothing soon give way to innocent victims of flesh and blood. December 1991. In the Laurentian Mountains, northwest of Montreal, a male suspect has broken into homes and savaged crude female mannequins made from lingerie. At the same time, a woman named Anna Maria Cordina Leva remains missing. The cases will be connected, but not before a sadistic man exposes himself in a string of violent crimes. January 1992, St. Calixte, Quebec. The town of 5,000 sits in the foothills of the Laurentians, a short drive from the area where the break-ins took place. Two residents of St. Calixte are Roland Asselin Bocage and her husband Richard. Richard heads off early for a day in the city. He recently purchased a dog for his wife, who often stays at home while he is at work in nearby Montreal. Later that morning, as Roland takes her dog outside for a walk, a strange car approaches her home. Roland Aslan was in her front yard. This man shows up, pulls up this car, and strikes up a conversation with her. The man explains that he is lost and asks Roland for directions. Lui l'a interpellé. Uh... He called out to her and asked her for a glass of water. She led him into her house. 
Once he was in the house, she brought him a glass of water to the front entrance. Now out of view of the neighbors, the stranger suddenly forces his way into the residence, throwing Roland to the floor. Five thirty p.m. Just after dark, Roland's husband Richard returns. As he pulls up, he notices that the house is dark, apart from the dim, flickering light from the TV inside. He senses that something is wrong. Entering the house, he spots his wife Roland face down in a pool of blood. She is dead. Richard clamors to the phone and calls for help. Provincial police are soon at the home, followed by homicide detectives. The media in nearby Montreal also learn of the crime. At the time, we had a police desk, and there was almost 24 hours a day, there was somebody in this little room with a bank of scanners listening to all the police radios, the ambulance, the fire, and they would look for the things that are worth pursuing and phone on the cell phone and say, you know, quick, you got to get here. There's this happening. Crime scenes can be pretty tough. The, the, the key is being the first one there and getting there fast. As the media arrives outside, forensic experts inside capture the grim crime scene on film. Roland Asselin Bocage's hands have been tied tightly behind her back, and she has been shot in the head at close range. In the morgue, more gruesome details come to light. Roland's corpse has been mutilated in the genital and breast area by a knife, likely after she was shot. Pieces of her own breast are discovered lodged inside her mouth. The brutal nature of the murder shakes even the most seasoned investigators. Roland, apparently her whole front was completely opened up. It wasn't just slashing, stabbing. She, he completely opened up her, her, her whole torso was, was, was opened up. Again, after she'd been shot, it's like desecrating a, a, a the dead body. At the crime scene, investigators find a 22 caliber shell casing, as well as a bullet lodged in the floor. They also find the knife used in the mutilation, a blade grabbed from the victim's own kitchen. But all attempts to secure fingerprints and trace biological evidence left behind by the killer turn up nothing. In the days that follow, police interview neighbors, friends, and residents throughout the small town. Nobody recalls seeing anything suspicious, nor hearing a gunshot. Police are left without a lead. No evidence connects the murder of Roland Asselin Bocage to the series of break-ins elsewhere in the Laurentian Mountains. But in retrospect, the crimes bear the hallmark of the same sadistic mind. Some fear a dangerous man will soon be stalking his next victim. Those fears are justified. In the fall of 1992, one of Canada's most gruesome serial killers is a ticking time bomb, ready to strike again. November 1992. Montreal police have yet to solve the two-year-old missing persons case involving Anna Maria Cordina Leva. At the same time, Provincial police have no leads in the brutal murder and mutilation of Roland Asselin Bocage. A dangerous killer remains on the loose. November 25th, 1996. Du Montaigne's Quebec, a small city of less than 20,000 residents just west of Montreal. Du Montaigne is a, is a really quiet residential I'd say middle class kind of town. It's not the kind of place where you'd expect something violent or, or really rough to, to take place. 
24-year-old Chantal Briere is one of Du Montan's residents. She lives with her common-law husband, Raymond, and her six-year-old son, Jonathan. Chantal, c'était une personne qui était joviale, qui aimait le monde autour. Chantal was a vibrant person that loved children and always loved having people around. She'd wanted to have a large family. She was a hard worker. She was very attentive with her parents. She often took my mother out to eat at restaurants and to do her banking. She was a good person. At the time, Chantal and Raymond are selling their house. Many prospective buyers stop by to check out the property. La vendait, c'était pas un agent d'immeuble qui l'avait, c'était ils ont décidé de la, de la mettre à vendre. She was selling it without a real estate agent. They decided to sell it on their own, privately. And this man, he'd called to inquire about the house. La maison, puis. Euh... C'est elle qui avait pris l'appel. Monsieur travaillait à ce moment-là. She was the one who took the call because her spouse was working at the time. The man offered to come see the house. He asked her if he could come that Thursday morning. November 26th, Thursday. Raymond heads off to work while Chantel prepares to show their home to the mystery caller. Ce matin-là, Chantal est allée reconduire le, son petit garçon. That morning, Chantal drove her little boy. She had a little boy. She drove him to my mother's house so she could look after him. She didn't give her any details. She'd only said that there was someone who was coming to see the house. Then Chantal went back to her house to wait for the man. By the time she returns, the prospective buyer is already there waiting for her. He told her that he was the man that was interested in buying the house. He told her that he didn't bring his car. He told her that he came on the train from Montreal because his wife worked in Montreal. And she wanted to know how long the trip was from Montreal to Deux Montagnes. He entered the house into the doorway area. It was 11 o'clock. He then told the lady that he was going to go and get his Polaroid camera to take some pictures. The man returned to the house with his Polaroid camera around 12.15 p.m. They were discussing the house when her spouse called home to see if the potential buyer had showed up. She told him yes, he did show up, and he is actually here right now and has some questions for you. The man speaks briefly with Raymond about the home, then hangs up. A few minutes later, Chantel's mother calls. And she said, you know, I can't talk. There's a man here about the house, to see the house. I'll, I'll talk to you later. And about half an hour later, the mother calls and there's no answer. And she keeps trying to call, keeps trying to call. Chantal Briere's mother was worried. She was worried because Chantal was not at home and she was not answering. 5 p.m. Chantal's mother contacts her other daughter, Francine, to share her concerns. The two decide to investigate. When we got there, there were no lights on in the house. The only thing that was on was the television. We could see reflections of the television from the street. And when we arrived, my mother said, we're not going in there. Something has happened. It's not normal. At that moment, when we went into the house, my mother was behind me. We went in anyway. I called out her name. I called out Chantal. She didn't answer me. And that's when I found her on the floor. And they find her on her stomach naked from the waist down. I yelled at my mother not to come in, to get out of the house. She left, and I went closer to the body. When I touched her, I felt that she was cold. 
That's when I saw that she was dead. I found the telephone and called to police. Two different police forces are notified of what appears to be another gruesome homicide. The local police at Deux Montagnes were called, but because of the type of case, they contacted the Sûreté de Québec, and our unit was sent out. Reporters and photographers arrive from nearby Montreal as the perimeter is established around the crime scene. Every scene is different. You know, you, you never know what you're going to get. You can't really describe the best picture that tells the story in one picture. While the media captures the mood outside, forensic experts inside photograph the scene up close. As in the murder of Roland Asselin Bocage, Chantelle's wrists have been bound behind her back. She had around her neck an electric cord, like the cords from a lamp that he cut around the neck, and her throat was swollen, and her body in other parts was mutilated. She had a bra around her mouth and neck, almost as a gag, and choking her. And when they removed that, they found a sock down her throat wasn't done before or while she was being strangled. It was inserted after she was already dead. All of a sudden, the police now had a pattern that here are women who had been not just murdered, but mutilated. There was a something very particular about the way he left the cadavers, and Chantal Briere had a bit of that signature as well. Around the same time, Chantel's husband Raymond learns of the tragedy. He grieves with other family members still reeling from the discovery. It's difficult to say. I was very sad. My mother wasn't able to speak. At the police station, investigators hope that those closest to the victim can shed some light on the crime. Once we got there, they asked us to make a statement explaining what had happened and what I had seen. At first, the same night, they suspected Raymond, Chantal's partner. They kept him quite a while. I was sure that it wasn't Raymond. He was very loving, the both of them were. He really loved her and I knew that it couldn't have been him. Investigators soon come to the same conclusion. Raymond was at work the entire time, providing him with a solid alibi. Instead, they soon focus suspicion on the mystery visitor who stopped by earlier that day. Raymond Latour was used mostly for information to tell us the comings and goings of Chantal Briere, and he also told us early on about the man who wanted to buy the house. He told us that at 12.15, he had called from work to see if the person had showed up and ended up speaking to the person on the phone. But Raymond knows little else about the man police now consider to be the prime suspect in at least one murder, possibly more. News of the crime moves quickly, shocking the bedroom community outside of Montreal. Compounding fears, the crime seems to be the work of the same man who killed Roland Asselin Bocage earlier that year, as well as savaged female mannequins and a string of disturbing break-ins. Meanwhile, back at the scene, investigators follow up on a hunch. One detective feels the killer may have stolen items or a keepsake from the crime. They do a careful inventory of Chantel's possessions. The hunch pays off. 
Along with other household items, Chantel's bank card appears to be missing. In his ongoing quest to cover his tracks, a serial killer is about to make a critical mistake. November 27, 1992. Police in Quebec investigate the murder of 24-year-old Chantal Briere. The crime is similar to another murder and mutilation, that of 47-year-old Roland Asselin Bocage, stoking fears that a serial killer is on the loose. Investigators have few leads, apart from the fact that their suspect appears to have stolen Chantal Briere's bank card. Armed with this information, police contact Chantal's bank to check for activity on her account. They learn a striking piece of news. Chantal's bank card was used at 12.58 p.m. the previous day, shortly after what police believe to have been her time of death. Chantal Briere's bank card had been used at a corner store, in a corner store in St. Eustache, which is about 10 kilometers from the location of the murder. If the transaction was covered by security cameras, police may be able to put a face on the killer. I immediately contacted the local police in St. Eustache, which is very close to Dumontans. I told them to go to the corner store and seize all the videotapes and to seize any trash cans that may contain paper that could be helpful, and if there was a video cassette recording, to stop it. The police arrived just in time. The worker on the 27th was the same person working as the night before and didn't think the tape contained anything special. So she put her tape from the 26th back in. So the tape was in the process of re-recording. And if we had gotten there an hour and 20 minutes later, we would have lost all the images from the day before. While police dust the ATM for fingerprints, others begin to review the tape at headquarters. But they quickly hit a roadblock. According to the bank, Chantel's card was used at exactly 12.58 p.m., but the security tape contains no time reference, making it difficult to know which customer to focus in on. It was a very busy corner store, and lots of people used the cash machine to take out money. Looking for a way to narrow down their search, police turn to the soundtrack on the tape, which technicians are able to enhance. They learn the radio in the store is tuned to a certain local music station. By contacting the station, police obtain a list of songs from the previous day, along with the time each song was played. At 12.58 p.m., when Chantel's card was being used, a song by a popular French musician was on the air. Police watch the security tape again, slowing it down in the section that carries the song. The clue leads them to a specific piece of footage, one that shows a balding man acting strangely around the automated teller machine. We see someone enter. He goes to the cash machine. Then he begins to speak to a lady. At that point, he begins to focus his attention on her. Therefore, it was a little suspicious because he went to the cash machine. Then he walks away from the cash machine and starts talking to a lady. Then she goes to the cash machine. He then goes to the counter and pays for something. And then he and the lady leave together. And then a few minutes later, the same man returns to use the cash machine. The man's second visit to the bank machine corresponds exactly with the time when murder victim Chantal Briere's card was used. At that point, we could easily recognize him because we saw him earlier at the counter paying. Therefore, we thought, this is the person. From the bank, police have the names of all the automated teller customers that day including the woman who appears to leave the store with the balding man they consider their prime suspect. A few hours later, they talk to the woman in her home. 
During the interview, a surveillance team outside make a stunning discovery. We were already questioning the lady because she used her card in the ATM. And then the surveillance team noticed the man from the tape in her apartment. The man is her husband, 36-year-old Serge Archambault. The same Serge Archambault who once had an affair with Anna Maria Cordinaleva, still considered a missing person by police in nearby Montreal. Once a butcher by trade, then the manager at the food plant where Anna Maria worked, Serge is now a traveling salesman. By all indications, he used the woman's bank card moments after her time of death. That evening, feeling they have found their man, police arrest Serge Archambault as he leaves his home in suburban St. Eustache. The move shocks friends and neighbors nearby who know Serge as a father and a family man. He just looked like someone's uncle or someone's brother. And to see someone who has been accused of such horrendous crimes is kind of a, a non-connect when you see that they could just be the person that lives next door to you. A search of his home proves otherwise, tying him to two brutal crimes. We found things from the house of Chantal Brière. We also found 22 caliber shells hidden in the roof of the basement bedroom, a child's bedroom. And they are positively identified to be the same bullets used in the murder of Roland Asselin in January. At the police station, Serge Archambault refuses a lawyer. Instead, he surprises investigators by fully confessing to both murders. He also speaks of an earlier violent crime. And at that time, Mr. Archambault admitted to having killed another victim two years earlier and buried her in a number of locations across the St. Lawrence River. That victim turns out to be missing person Anna Maria Cordina Leva. She was a friend from work who wanted to be his girlfriend. She became a very intimate friend of his. But he did not want to pursue the relationship, but she insisted. Mr. Archambault, who was married at the time, needed to get rid of the problem. So he killed Anna Maria, and that was the end of his problem. He murdered her, the decapitated her, cut her body into pieces, and went and buried him farther away. Serge leads police to the wooded area where he buried the dismembered remains of Anna Maria Cordina Leva. They painstakingly uncover pieces of bone from the ground, which are then examined by forensic anthropologist Kathy Reichs. Serge Archambault's training as a butcher earlier in his life appears to have been put to criminal use. In this case, what I found is that whoever had done this dismemberment knew anatomy. They knew what they were doing. So I suggested to police that it was someone who knew something about anatomy. It could have been a physician, it could have been a butcher. And as it turned out, the suspect in this case was in fact a butcher for part of his career. Here's a, a butcher who actually, rather than butchering animals, was butchering humans, was butchering women. Using the same technique you'd use on a, on a side of beef. Once he killed Anna Maria, it seemed like that was it, and uh, he, he wasn't able to stop himself anymore. In the case of Roland Asselin Bocage, Serge Archambault tells police he was driving north of Montreal when he simply picked his second victim at random. At the time, he was a company 
Il était vendeur. At the time, he was a traveling salesman. His days were usually pretty free. He could do what he liked and go at his own pace. It was normal for him to travel all around. I think that he had a taste for killing that day. Et lorsqu'il est arrivé dans le, le And when he arrived in the area where the murder took place, he saw a lady who was taking her dog out for a walk. Chantal Briere, his final victim, was also a stranger. But unlike his earlier attacks, Serge Archambault decided to steal as well, demanding Chantal's PIN number for her bank card before finally strangling and mutilating her. Less than a half hour after committing the murder, it was sheer coincidence that Serge ran into his own wife at the corner store where he was using Chantel's card. It was by identifying his wife that police were able to find him. It, it was obviously the biggest mistake he made. That's, that's what did him in, you know, a bank card. Because obviously it probably would have gone on. In the months that passed between each of his murders, Serge also confesses to searching for other victims amongst sex trade workers in the Montreal area. He started picking up hookers with the intent to kill them and mutilate them. A suitcase packed for murder was always close at hand. He carried a kit with him with rope a knife, a gun, that he would keep with him in his car. But most often, the prostitutes were asked to leave the car shortly after getting in, lucky to escape with their lives. He would either kick her out of the car just when he felt that he was going to do it, or if they were at a motel and sex was going to start, he would he'd catch himself and he'd, he'd, he'd leave or he'd kick the hooker out. Yet despite his many admissions, Serge never confesses to the break-ins that left hacked up mannequins on the beds of frightened residents. Mannequins mutilated in much the same way as the living victims he attacked. Nonetheless, police use a semen sample retrieved from one of the homes to tie him to the bizarre intrusions. After he was arrested, we began to look at all the files from the Montreal Police and the Sûreté de Québec to see if there were any similar cases. He only admitted to committing three murders, but there could have been more. Meanwhile, news that a serial killer is in custody eases local fears and provides some consolation to the families of the victims. It was a big relief for us because we didn't have to ask all the questions. Who had done this and why? And for myself, I was living by myself in an apartment. It helped a lot. Now dubbed the Butcher of St. Eustache, Serge Archambault undergoes a psychiatric assessment. It was just a matter of determining is he fit to stand trial, mentally fit to stand trial, and to set a trial date. Serge will face a judge and jury on three counts of first-degree murder. But his mental problems will prompt his defense lawyer to push for a much reduced charge of manslaughter. If successful, the butcher of St. Eustache could get off with a relatively light sentence, despite being responsible for some of Canada's most gruesome crimes. December 1992, 36-year-old Serge Archambault has been charged with three counts of first-degree murder, brutal killings that have created a wave of shock and grief across Quebec. I believe I hated him. I wanted him to pay for what he'd done to Chantal, and not just to Chantal, to the other two victims as well. Psychiatrists find that the man now dubbed the Butcher of St. Eustache is mentally sane and fit to stand trial. Nevertheless, he is diagnosed as a dangerous sexual sadist, one who first began fantasizing about harming women when he was a child. He had these urges that got stronger as he got older to kill and mutilate. 
At one point, he even wrote his mother, his sister, some female cousins, any female relative wrote them saying, you know, I'm warning you that I could just, I could snap sometime and that you may not be safe around me. He's just totally obsessed. But his dark urges simmered beneath the surface, eventually exploding into the string of brutal murders that claimed the lives of Anna Maria Cordina Leva, Roland Asselin Bocage, and Chantel Briere. In November of 1993, one of Canada's most dangerous serial killers finally faces trial. Although he has confessed to his crimes, it will be up to the court to determine whether he is sentenced for first-degree murder or some lesser charge. He was being followed pretty closely by all the French and English media, all the newspapers and TV and radio, just because it was just the grisly details, and you just don't get that every day. It had all the elements. It was more like fiction than, than, than true. The prosecution begins with a steady stream of witnesses, including psychiatrists, police officers, and family members, many of whom describe in detail their horrible discoveries. There were more than 50 witnesses, and hearing what he had done to his women, the mutilation, and no regard whatsoever, it seemed. He just did it so cold-blooded. You could tell even the judge was disgusted, almost wincing during some of the testimony, you know, and they, they usually try and stay pretty objective. For family members, it is their first face-to-face -face glimpse of the man who stole the lives of their loved ones. Well, you feel their sadness and their emptiness and their rage. How could this guy do this? And here he is sitting there. The worst that could happen, he's going to go to jail for the rest of his life. They weren't words strong enough to describe what, what he was like and what he had done. He's obviously a sadist. I was there the entire time, every day. I can't say really. It was really intense. I didn't want him dead, but I wanted him to go to prison. As for his defense, Serge Archambault's lawyer claims his client is not guilty of premeditated first-degree murder. Instead, he claims Serge is a victim of sudden violent compulsions that he can't control. But the prosecution is quick to point out that by his own admission, Serge Archambault often traveled with a suitcase or kit packed with the tools of murder, something that they argue showed his clear intent to harm. On November 19th, 1993, the trial ends. After a short deliberation, the jury returns, holding hands and fighting back tears. They find Serge Archambault to be guilty of first-degree murder on all three counts. At the verdict, everyone was happy. After the fear, everyone said in their hearts, we'd never see him again, and he would be in prison for the rest of his days. These were three rather brutal murders, and the fact that he was stalking women suggested that there might have been more in the future, so I feel safer knowing that he's not out there on the streets. It was one of the more satisfying cases I've done because we solved it. The judge sentences Serge Archambault to life in prison. But for the families of the victims, no amount of justice can ever undo the damage already done. We're dealing with it. We all miss Chantal. She was a person that loved to have a good time. She loved having people around. And when I think of her, I think of all the things she's missing. There were so many things she had yet to see. And now it's finished. She'll never see any of them. She was always there, and now she's gone. It's hard to accept. 
Today, the butcher of St. Ostash continues to do time in a federal prison. Although eligible for parole after 25 years, the sheer horror of his sadistic crimes makes it unlikely that he will ever haunt the public again. On so many levels, he's a danger to society. Once you served your full time, in a case like that, the families or even the Crown can ask that he be uh, deemed a dangerous offender, at which point he can be kept indefinitely. If ever there was a case for it, he's the one. <laughs>